most of the guidelines, they are focused on fat reduction, especially saturated fat, as you've seen. And they are very liberal with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates actually get a pass on the, car on the guidelines. And this carb-centric approach obviously has not worked. We, we, we you know, just look around. Uh, it's not helping with public health and obesity. <coughs> And there is no, ch no shortage of high quality studies suggesting that a low carb diet may be effective to tackle all of those problems, the obesity epidemic, the diabetes epidemic. And yet, it struggles to be accepted by mainstream medicine and academic circles. The public health collaboration uh, in which Dr. Mahotra is a member of the advisory board uh, keeps an updated list of all randomized controlled trials comparing low carb versus low fat for fat loss. And this is the most recent update. And what you can see is uh, there are a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials showing superiority of low carb for weight loss. Uh, some of them uh, you don't see a statistical difference. But what is interesting is there is no single study in which a low-fat diet has been better than a low-carb diet for weight loss. So in terms of the totality of the literature, so we are not cherry-picking here, in terms of the totality of the literature, there is actually no doubt that one approach is superior or at least as good as. And the same is true for obesity, twin brother, type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a glucose intolerance condition. One of the ways you diagnose it is actually by giving the patient a glucose solution so he or she can drink it. And then you see uh, how much the <coughs> glucose level, the blood sugar will go up. And if it goes up a lot, it means the person is intolerant to glucose. So yeah a diet that is low in bioavailable glucose is obviously the best choice. Why I say bioavailable glucose? As Eric said, uh, cellulose uh, is glucose, but you don't digest it. I mean, you can eat a lot of broccoli and your uh, blood sugar won't go up. Uh, if you work as a health professional, you should read this. Right? You can take pictures, okay? This is freely available. It is a very nice review, a lot of good people writing here, and they basically say that diet, dietary carbohydrate restriction, low carb diet, is the first approach in diabetes management, uh, should be. Now, this is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials for low carb interventions for diabetes. So this is um, the highest level of evidence you find. And the conclusion I'll read for you is a low carb diet has a greater effect on glycemic control in diabetes compared to a high carb diet. Should be obvious, but it's nice to have uh, such levels of evidence. And the greater the carbohydrate restriction, the greater the glucose lowering. Again, should be obvious, but this is what the literature shows. So again, there seems to be no uh, doubt that a low-carb diet is good for diabetes. So the question is, why there is so much resistance to this approach? Why is it not mainstream? Because the current guidelines were developed with a single focus, LDL. Dr. Mahotra was telling me during the lunch, it's those three letters, LDL. Okay. If something increases it, you should avoid it. If it decreases, go ahead and eat it. That's basically what the guidelines say. And in addition, there are several myths that have been perpetuated by physicians and dietitians regarding those imaginary dangers to the kidneys, to the liver, to the bones, and others. So I like this uh, editorial because <laughs> Uh, it's written by Dr. Nissen, which is actually the head of cardiovascular medicine uh, in um, the Cleveland Clinic. So this guy is very mainstream. And once the new guidelines were issued in 2015, uh, he wrote, 
U.S. Dietary Guidelines, an evidence-free zone. Those are strong words for a peer-reviewed paper. Wow. Okay? And what, what he writes is, how strong is the evidence supporting the current guidelines? Most of the recommendations are similar to prior guidelines. In fact, if you look from 77 to now, very little change. Uh, however, a detailed review of the new guidelines confirm a disturbing reality, the nearly complete absence of high-quality randomized controlled trials, which are the best evidence, studying meaningful clinical outcomes for dietary interventions. And unfortunately, the current and past US dietary guidelines represent a nearly evidence-free zone. So it's not myself or Dr. Mahotra only that are saying it. This is becoming a mainstream view. And he continues. Uh, as a consequence of the widespread promotion of low-fat, low-cholesterol diets, Americans gradually reduced their consumption of these harmful, quotes, ingredients. We reduced dietary fat, but binged on carbohydrates and became increasingly obese. Type 2 diabetes grew into an epidemic that is now threatening to reverse decades of progress in reducing coronary heart disease. The obsession with low-fat diets has resulted in some extraordinary and bizarre food marketing practices. And this is funny, and you, we all saw this. Recently, I observed a large, ba large bag of fat-free gummy bears, you know, <laughs> the sugary thing, sitting on a grocery store shelf with the unmistakable implication that fat-free equates heart health. So if we ask people what's the most important risk factor for heart disease, and it doesn't matter if you ask the regular people on the street or the doctor, his answer will probably be LDL, more than likely. Could be smoking, it is a risk factor. Could be high blood pressure, sure, it is a risk factor. Obesity, yeah, BMI is a risk factor. But what about insulin resistance, the metabolic syndrome? A lot of people don't even know what this is, and many doctors don't pay attention to this, or don't pay as much attention as they should. They only think of LDL. So are we barking up the wrong tree? Okay? <laughs> Maybe we are just as mistaken as this dog, and the problem is there. So what is insulin resistance? It is one of the most important risk factors for many chronic and degenerative diseases. Not only diabetes, but also heart disease, cancer, and even Alzheimer's. So yes, yeah, <laughs> it is important for Alzheimer's. So let's understand insulin resistance. What does resistance mean in a biological sense? <coughs> well, it usually resists any prolonged, intense, and repetitive stimulus. Uh, it means that uh, the, the intensity of the stimulus must go up in order to have the same effect as the body gets used. Okay. Several examples. This is a damaging stimulus. If you get it too much, too intense, too repetitive. Okay. So this guy <laughs> was very sensitive to the ultraviolet rays. He was not resistant. But if he keeps exposing himself, he may get a nice tan. Now, this area of the skin has become ultraviolet resistance, resistance to a certain point. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ethanol. Mm -hmm. Okay, this guy is very sensitive to the effects <laughs> of ethanol. <laughs> but if he keeps trying, he may get tough, like this guy. Well, this Superman is pretty tough. Okay? So, what happens is. Uh, as the person uh, starts drinking and keeps increasing the dose of alcohol, he or she will become more resistant to the effects of ethanol. So he, if he wants to get as drunk as before, he needs more alcohol. Okay? That's the meaning of resistance. Now let's think about glucose, insulin, fat reduction in this sense. Fat regulation, sorry. Uh, this is in Portuguese, sorry, I forgot to translate. Um, <laughs> Whenever you eat carbohydrates, and it doesn't matter if it's very refined or if it's a brown uh, whole wheat uh, bread, <laughs> 200 grains, okay, it will all turn into glucose in the end. That's what digestion means. 
okay? And whenever you eat glucose, your insulin will go up. It needs to go up, okay? And insulin, aside from controlling glucose levels, insulin is the main hormone that is regulating fat cells, adipocytes, okay? It increases the storage of fat, and it decreases the release of the storage fat. So, just like the ultraviolet rays, just like the alcohol, if you have chronic exposure to high insulin, it will lead to fat deposition, as we saw, and it will lead to resistance, okay, by the same token. To force the same amount of glucose into the cell now, we need more insulin because of the resistance. This leads to chronically elevated insulin levels, and this is a classical vicious cycle. Okay, what happens when insulin is high all the time? So this is the pancreas. Pancreas is making insulin. And insulin does what it does. It, it, it helps the glucose get into the cells because it makes the cell express, uh, transport molecules for glucose. Now, this is Tokyo subway. <laughs> and these guys, they're actually supposed to push people into the uh, wagons, okay? So they will fit more people there. So think of those guys as insulin, okay? And why there is resistance? Because it's full of people. When the cell gets full of glucose, it is hard to push more glucose into the cell, okay? So all you need is more insulin, okay? That, that, that's the disease process, because of course, what you should need is less people. <laughs> Okay, then you would not have resistance. But if you have a lot of people, a lot of glucose trying to get into the cell at the same time, then you, ne you need more insulin to help push it. Okay? Uh, Dr. Gerald Raven was uh, the person that first uh, um, picked it up, this idea. Uh, he was the father of the metabolic syndrome, the insulin resistance syndrome. He just passed away recently. So what does insulin do? <coughs> Let's think about it, because it helps us understand the metabolic syndrome. It reduces blood sugar, it stores fat, it blocks lipolysis, so it makes it harder for you to get the fat out. It stimulates fat production by the liver, so fatty liver and it retains sodium and water. It retains salt and water in the kidneys, which will probably raise your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. blood, sugar. Uh, blood pressure. Yeah. So it is very common. It is an indirect way of measuring, of diagnosing insulin resistance by its symptoms. And it's the most important risk factor for a lot of chronic diseases, but it receives proportionally little attention. Most people know their cholesterol levels. If you ask people, they can tell you by heart what their cholesterol levels are. But most people don't know their insulin levels. Most people don't pay attention to their HDL levels or to their HbA1c levels, but they know their cholesterol. Uh, this paper uh, was uh, actually based on a talk, very famous talk, that Dr. Raven gave in 88, and it was converted into a paper. And here he puts it very elegantly. Resistance to insulin stimulated glucose uptake is a common phenomenon, I mean insulin resistance. The compensatory response to this defect is to secrete more insulin. It is just like every other kind of biological resistance. Insulin resistance leads to hyperinsulinemia, insulinemia, impaired glucose tolerance, increased triglycerides, decreased HDL. This is the metabolic syndrome. At the time, he called it syndrome, syndrome X, but now we know it as the metabolic syndrome. Okay? Uh, Dr. Malhotra already uh, mentioned it. It is the large weight circumference, the high triglycerides, the low HDL, the low good cholesterol, uh, and the increased blood pressure. You don't need to have all of them. If you have three of them, you can be called a insulin resistant person. Elevated fast blood, fast, fasting blood sugar is also part. It doesn't need to be diabetic, just <coughs> elevated. And unofficially, you can also lump together here uh, high uric acid uh, levels, fatty liver, inflammation, which 
uh, can be measured by those. So the vicious cycle is insulin resistance leads to chronic, uh, high, chronically high insulin levels. This hyperinsulinemia, as, as it's called, leads to metabolic syndrome, and metabolic syndrome is the clinical manifestation of insulin resistance. So it is not exactly the same, but it's almost the same. Now, why is it important? This is a very interesting paper. What they did is a mathematical analysis trying to pinpoint uh, if you could change one risk factor, which one would be the, more, the, the most important? Take a look. If you could reduce insulin resistance, you would avoid 42% of myocardial infarction. What about LDL? It has an impact, but it's 16%. It is much, <coughs> much less. This is the same paper. Insulin resistance is the most important single risk factor for coronary artery disease. So it is not just, I mean, speculation that it may be more important there than LDL. It is, of course, much more important. Now, this is another study. This was uh, conducted at Kaiser in the US. They are a huge uh, insurer, health insurer. Uh, and they selected 100,000 patients that had a follow-up of at least eight years. And what was the best predictor for cardiovascular disease in that population? Now, insulin resistance as defined by high triglycerides and low HDL. Those two alone help you find out if the person has insulin resistance or not. Was more predictive of ischemic heart disease than LDL. So what I'm trying to show is that I'm not cherry picking one single paper. Here is another one. Oh, I mean, this is the same one, but this is very interesting, this graph. Here are people with low LDL cholesterol, and here are people with high LDL cholesterol. And what you can see is the graphs are very similar. They look alike, okay? Now, what is the black bar? The black bar are people that are insulin sensitive. And this bar is the people that are insulin resistant. So it, it is much better to be someone with high LDL cholesterol, but insulin sensitive than somebody with low cholesterol, but insulin resistant, okay? Now, you can see LDL has some impact, because you see there is this little difference between this black bar and that black bar. So I'm not telling you that LDL is completely uh, bullshit, <laughs> okay? But it's close to but This is actually from the Framingham study that was alluded before, okay? And what we had here, it was HDL, increasing HDL, and this is increasing LDL. So those very high bars are people that have low HDL. And these very short bars are people with high LDL. People with high LDL will have low risk, even if they, uh, I mean high HDL, we have low risk, even if their LDL goes up, okay? And people with low L, uh, HDL have high risk even with low, uh, with, uh, low LDL. So HDL obviously has, uh, is much more important in determining risk. And HDL is related to the insulin resistance syndrome, to metabolic syndrome. <coughs> this is a paper by Dr. Raven, the same one I mentioned before. So what they did here, they got 200 something patients and evaluated by their degree of insulin resistance, and they <coughs> used the state-of-the-art method, something that you will only use in research. It's very complicated, but it's very precise. And people were followed prospectively for a mean of six years. Those are insulin-resistant people. Many of them developed chronic diseases, not only heart disease, okay? You have uh, cerebrovascular accidents, hypertension, and cancer. But none of the people that were very insulin resistant developed anything in those six years. So it is very rare to have such discrimination by one measure. So insulin resistance is, in fact, a very important risk factor. Again, another paper, just to show you that I'm not cherry picking. Okay, this is triglycerides divided by HDL. I already told you, this is a surrogate for insulin resistance. Okay. 
okay? And it pretty much predicts the extension of coronary disease as seen during angiography. So we have here uh, triglycerides divided by HDL, which are clearly associated with the extension of coronary disease. Look where total cholesterol <coughs> is. Guys, when you have a line like this, if it's on the line, it means it doesn't help and it doesn't hurt. It has no effect. It has no predictive value. Okay? LDL, a little bit better. Triglycerides, if you look only at triglycerides, not much better. HDL is protective, as we know. But the ratio is much more predictive. And the ratio here is a surrogate for insulin resistance. Yet another paper. Okay? This one is a huge cohort of women. Okay? And here are a lot of risk factors for heart disease. Now, LDL is over there, close to the line, is the worst prediction, predictor. It is not completely useless, but it's close to. Okay? What about total cholesterol divided by HDL? As Dr. Malhotra said before, it is much better as a predictor. Much, much better. And this is inflammation, okay? CRP. So inflammation is a much better predictor than LDL. So yeah. Uh, this was also briefly mentioned before, okay? But uh, the LDL, actually, LDL are lipoprotein particles. Cholesterol is always the same cholesterol, but it travels inside particles. It's just like, you know, passengers inside of a bus, and the bus is the particle. So it is better to have smaller buses, uh, uh, to have larger buses than the smaller ones. It is better to have large, so-called fluffy, because they float, they are less dense particles, than the dense, small particles, okay? This is called pattern B, and I remember as B for bad, Okay, so you know this is not good. Now, look at this graph. Again, triglycerides divided by HDL. A surrogate, a marker for insulin resistance. As it got, gets better, I mean smaller triglycerides, higher HDL, you have almost all phenotype A, the good one, the fluffy particles. Okay, the phenotype B, the bad particles, the small, dense ones, they increase as this degrades, I mean, as you develop insulin resistance. Now, I will come in this with us. <laughs> and he lent me these slides, which are very interesting, because, you know, there are much better markers than LDL for coronary heart disease. Uh, this is the coronary artery calcium score. It is a CT scan, no, no contrast. If you have zero calcium score, you have very, very little, a very small uh, risk of heart disease in the next 10 years. And this is, doesn't change much according to your LDL. You may have high LDL, but if you have a score <coughs> of zero, there was a paper, uh, uh, and the title of the paper was a zero, a score of zero, gives you a 15-year warranty against heart, uh, heart disease. And again, it's unusual language for a peer review paper. So, but, but the effect was so strong that the authors uh, put it there. Okay? And here, if you have a really high <coughs> calcium score, then you have a very, very high risk. And again, this is independent of your LDL. See what tracks with calcium score? As you get more calcium in your coronary arteries, your risk goes up. Diabetes makes it go up. Blood pressure is associated with higher his risk. <coughs> LDL, not so much. So what's uh, amazing is how much attention this gets to how little predictive value it has. So this is a new paradigm that uh, is being proposed. Instead of the lipid hypothesis, this would be the hyperglycemic, hyperinsulinemic, inflammatory <laughs> hypothesis. Okay, uh, a high carb diet, a high fructose diet, and when you read fructose, read sugar. We are not talking about fruit here. A high, a high fructose diet is a, is a high sugar diet. Okay, it will basically create 
all the things that compose metabolic syndrome, high glucose, high insulin, high triglycerides, low HDL, you name it, okay? And this associated with those uh, inflammatory fats, those industrial seed oil fats that we've been stimulated to consume more, okay, but are actually inflammatory, will give rise to what is actually killing people nowadays. Inflammation, metabolic syndrome, coronary heart disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension. Now, I won't go uh, through all of this. This is a small randomized controlled trial comparing a high-carb, low-fat diet with a low-carb, high-fat diet. And when it says high-fat, it doesn't mean, as Eric said, that you need to gorge on fat. That's not the point. It means uh, it is higher in fat than your average food pyramid diet, OK? And basically, it reverses all coronary risk factors more effectively, uh, effectively than the low-fat diet that people are being stimulated to eat, OK? Now, you could say that's a single RCT. That's one paper. So I may be cherry picking. So I'm not cherry picking. This is a systematic review and meta analysis of clinical trials of low carb diet and what they do <coughs> to your coronary risk factors. Okay? So this is much stronger evidence. And I'll highlight what comp uh, uh, the, the metabolic syndrome components here. So you see abdominal circumference, blood pressure, triglycerides, glucose, glycated hemoglobin, uh, HDL, it all gets better on a low-carb diet. And not now we know, we've discussed it, that the metabolic syndrome is a much more important risk factor for heart disease. Low-density lipoprotein, LDL, did not change significantly. But even if it had changed, even if the LDL had gone up a little bit, we've seen it. If we, if all those risk factors that get better and LDL gets a little worse, we are still much better off. Now, insulin resistance begins many years before type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is just the the end result. Okay. Plasma glucose levels, blood sugar can be completely normal, and yet you can be insulin resistant. So how do you know? There was some groundbreaking work by Dr. Joseph Kraft, and who wants to see it should see the interview uh, that was done by my good friend. Uh, it is in the internet. Just look for Joseph Kraft interview in YouTube. He had more than 14,000 patients uh, do a insulin and glucose curve, okay? So instead of measuring just the glucose response to a glucose challenge, let's measure insulin also. Otherwise, how can you know if the person is insulin resistant or not, okay? So there are some parameter parameters of normality. I don't need to go over them. But the basic uh, normal pattern would be a rapid rise of the insulin, not too much, and it falls quickly, okay? And there are many other patterns that are pathological, and you <coughs> see them in people <coughs> with normal blood sugar. But that's an expensive and demanding test. It needs five hours to be completed, and the person needs to be there fasting, taking blood for five hours, okay? So people have been trying to find other markers that are easier. So the HOMA, higher IR, <laughs> um, is a formula that takes into account both insulin and glucose, glucose fasting. Um, a number less than two is fine, is okay. <coughs> if it's less than one, it's excellent. You are very insulin sensitive. But if it's higher than three, that means trouble, okay? Mm -hmm. Higher than three usually means you are insulin resistant. This is not as precise as Kraft's test, but it's much easier for you to order and do and perform. So let me give you some examples. Okay? Uh, imagine a person with a glucose of 85 and an insulin of 4. If we do the calculation, very good. Okay? Less than one, very insulin sensitive. So how we interpret it? 
we think, okay, this guy has very good glucose levels and he requires just a tiny little bit of insulin to get the glucose that low. So he or she is very sensitive to the effect of insulin. Another example, glucose is a little high, but the insulin is low. So this person sometimes will show up at the clinic very worried that he or she may be insulin resistant, I mean pre-diabetic or diabetic, whatever. But if you do the calculation, again, it's fine, okay? Because it requires very little insulin to have this glucose. Now, this person has a glucose of 85, who he thinks he's okay, and his doctor thinks he's okay, okay? But if you look at his insulin, it's high. So how do you interpret it? See, the level is more than three. He needs four times more insulin than the first one to have the same glucose, okay? So this is insulin resistance at its beginning. Insulin is going up, glucose is still normal. So how you diagnose insulin resistance at a glance, okay? If you can't do the craft test, which would be the gold standard. Central obesity, waist divided by height. You should not be uh, as large, okay, as to have uh, a waist that is more than half your height. Okay? And this is highly correlated with that index we were discussing. And this is very easy. It's, there is no cost. You just need a measuring tape. That's all. And if you look at somebody and it has this body shape, mainly central obesity. See, if I didn't put the waist up, you would think he's a thin guy. OK, look at his arms, his legs. This is central obesity. You can bet he's insulin resistant just by looking. Okay. High triglycerides, low HDL, we talked about it. Those are markers of insulin resistance. High uric acid may be also. Glucose close to the limit or higher. So it is not, if somebody has a glucose close to the limit or higher, but everything else is okay, there is not a problem. But if it's in this context, yes, you should think of insulin resistance. The ratio, triglycerides by HDL, greater than two, or total cholesterol by HDL, greater than 4.5. Fatty liver. Fatty liver is one of the most important markers that there is some metabolic problem going on. So high liver enzymes suggest this. High ferritin in this context. Many years ago, if you see somebody with a high ferritin, you would think he has a genetic disease that accumulates iron. This is not true anymore. Most people nowadays that have high ferritin do that because they have fatty liver, okay? High CRP, uh, which is a measure of inflammation, most more than likely because of the inflammation of the liver because of the fatty liver, okay? So fatty liver, um, central obesity. Uh, and this brings up, uh, us back to the metabolic syndrome. So you see there is a big overlap between insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Now, look at this uh, news report. Low carb diet better than low fat diet at improving metabolic syndrome. Now I'm going to highlight the date. There's <laughs> nothing new, okay? We, we know this for a long time. We are 2018, this is 2005, uh, uh, okay? It's nothing new. And the reason it works is pretty obvious also, okay? If you have somebody that is diabetic and you give him or she uh, a, a high glycemic index diet, a high carb diet, the glucose excursions will be huge compared with a low carb diet, okay? So we are definitely barking up the wrong tree. Because you know, everything that people just, uh, since the inception of the guidelines, this was all that people were looking at. But then, those are the real risk factors. So what's the trunk, what's the stem of this tree? Is insulin resistance. So we should be looking at this. 
This is, if, if this is not completely useless, it is of course less important than those. But this is what is happening today, right? <laughs> is bacon bad? Is coconut oil bad because it erases your LDL? And the insulin resistance is there, is the elephant in the room. Okay. So why is there so much resistance to change? Because I've shown you a, some many papers in terms of evidence. So, low carb is better to achieve and maintain weight loss. We've seen that. It is better to control type 2 diabetes. I don't think this is something contentious. It is an obvious solution for metabolic syndrome. So, I think the biggest problem is not to solve insulin resistance, it's evidence resistance. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, a piece of the puzzle is there are many uh, myths surrounding low-carb diets. So now we are going to examine some of those myths. Low-carb and the kidneys. <laughs> so patients with chronic kidney disease do have trouble excreting many substances, including water. Okay. Um, so it is true that for those people that are already sick, okay, they have chronic kidney disease, they should not be put on a high protein diet. However, a low carb diet is not a high protein diet, and I will show you that. Mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, there is an analogy that I like to use. A patient with late stage heart disease, heart failure, cannot tolerate very uh, intense exercise, okay? In fact, they, he, he may die if you put him on a intense exercise. But does that mean that exercise is bad for the heart? Of course not. Okay? So this is a logical fallacy. The logical fallacy is very sick heart equals low exercise tolerance. Correct. But exercise does not cause heart disease. Likewise, very sick kidneys do not tolerate a high protein diet. But a high protein diet does not cause kidney disease. You see? Now, there is research on that. Uh, this is a randomized control trial, okay? And I put it in red here to show you that this is not the usual observational stuff. Okay, this is a randomized control trial of people in a very low carb diet with 124 grams of protein or a high carb diet with 85 grams of protein. And this study provides preliminary evidence that long-term weight loss with a very low-carb diet does not adversely affect renal function compared with a high-carb diet in obese individuals with normal renal function. But then you may say, okay, but this is a small trial, 68 men, it lasted only one year. What if we continue it for more, more time? So, how about 6,000 people followed from uh, 2002 to 2008? And those are not regular people. Those are people with type 2 diabetic, diabetes and high risk for kidney failure. Um, in this graph, everything that is to this side of the line uh, is protective, and everything that is to the other side of the line is bad for your kidneys. I highlighted animal protein in on purpose just to show that animal protein is actually associated with better outcomes in those people that have high risk for kidney disease and are diabetics. The basically the only thing that was bad was carbohydrates. And again, they are diabetics, so you should expect that. Because what is bad for the kidneys of people with diabetes is high blood sugar. It has nothing to do with proteins. Okay? Again, I'm not cherry picking. There is another big study. Okay? This is 8,600 patients followed for six and a half years. Uh, and what you see here is renal function was completely not associated with the amount of protein you ate. But all cause mortality was if you eat very little protein, you die more. <laughs> but here's a question for you. 
are low carb diets really high in protein? Somebody, and when Eric asked, somebody said uh, it is a high protein diet. In fact, you can design a high protein diet, but usually if people are left alone choosing what they want to eat in a low carb diet, it is not a high protein diet. Yeah. So here is uh, Dr. John Yudkin. We've talked about him before. John Yudkin was one of the pioneers of uh, research in low carb. And see, it's interesting. He was studying the nutrient intake of subjects on a low carb diet for the treatment of obesity. This was 1970. Uh, it was very normal, very usual to use a low carb diet for treating obesity at that time. Okay, so he's not discussing here if low carb is good or not for losing weight. He's just studying the nutrient intake. So normal diet, low carb diet, see the protein is exactly the same. And this study is not an outlier. Okay, if you look here, uh, this is a great study. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a very high impact, very respected paper uh, journal. Okay, uh, and this was a randomized control trial comparing weight loss with low carb, Mediterranean, or low fat. And I should add, the Mediterranean and the low fat arms of this study were calorie restricted, and the low carb had calories free. Okay? What you can see here, let's look at the six month mark. Okay? This is the percent protein in the diet 19, 18, 21. And the error bars are plus or minus 3, which means this is all the same. All three diets ate the same amount of protein. So a low carb diet can be a high pro uh, a low carb diet can be a high protein diet, but it must be designed that way because the dietitian wants it. For example, for a athlete that is trying to increase his or her muscle mass, may be interesting to have a high protein diet. But left alone, people will eat more or less the same amount of protein. Because protein is very satiating. Once you get to a certain amount of protein, you will stop eating it, which is good. Now, this is a case report. A case report of low carb diet to prevent end stage renal failure. So how can something that prevents something be causing something? <laughs> you know? Uh, so this is a patient that is diabetic and is and his creatinine that measures his uh, kidney function is going up so he's getting worse okay creatinine is going up with his weight so both the creatinine is going up and showing that he is he has declining kidney failure uh, kidney function and his weight is going up this little arrow here is when he started a low carb diet okay then the weight goes down very fast and the creatinine <coughs> stops going up and actually starts going a little bit down. Now, this is his insulin use. He was using huge amounts of insulin. After studying low carb, zero insulin. And his blood sugar got better with less insulin. That's what you see when you take glucose out of the diet of someone that doesn't tolerate glucose in the diet. This is protein uh, elimination by the kidneys, which is also a marker of kidney disease, and it's also going down. Now, this is probably the least known important paper in terms of uh, diet and kidney failure. This paper should be widely read, should be known, okay, because it is a randomized control trial of almost 200 people. And they were uh, actually randomized to a low carb versus a normal uh, diet for someone with uh, kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And they had a follow up of almost four years. So it's a very robust paper. The diet was uh, a diet with 50% less carbs than before and unrestricted in everything else, including protein. <coughs> so these guys they are not at risk for uh, kidney failure. They already have kidney disease, and they are being randomized to a diet that is low carb, but otherwise unrestricted. And the other arm 
of the study, the control arm, is the standard low-protein diet that is usually prescribed for people with kidney disease. So the experimental diet was 35% carbs, 25 to 30% protein. So this was actually a higher protein diet. And 5 to 10% ethanol. So these guys were drinking. Okay? <laughs> and the control diet was a 65% carb, 10% protein. This is what you are taught at nutrition school. This, this is what they should be getting, okay? Now, it's almost 200 people. Their mean creatinine was 1.8, which means they had moderate kidney disease and they were randomized. And the end point, this is very important, the end point was progression to dialysis or death. So these are hard endpoints. This is not just blood, uh, blood uh, values, okay? There was an absolute not uh, relative, a absolute risk reduction of 19% for end stage kidney disease or death with just cutting the carbs in half in people with diabetes and kidney failure, okay? So I think I've convinced you that low carb is not bad for the kidneys. Yeah. <laughs> what about the liver? People say that somehow it will uh, overwhelm your liver. Don't know why, okay? Because there is this persistent myth and there is nothing in the peer review literature that even hints at that possibility. It's funny because at least when you talk about kidney with a nephrologist, he'll tell you, well, this high protein diet may do a hyper fight filtration thing in the glomeruli of the kidney. They have an ex a mechanistic explanation, okay? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. There is no reason it should be bad for your liver, but let's go on. Um, if you do a PubMed search with all the keywords, I've done that. Okay, from 1960s on, you cannot find a single paper implicating low carb in harming the liver. It's crazy, but the myth is perpetrated. I've heard it many, many times. I guess some of you have also. Uh -huh. So, in animals, what you see, many studies, what they show, excess fructose, again, sugar, in the diet leads to fat production and accumulation in the liver. Less carbs means less fatty liver. More protein also means less fatty liver. So even though low carb is not a high protein diet, if it were, it should be good. Mm -hmm. But what about in humans? This is a randomized control trial, it's a small yeah. one. And uh, the diets is, are isoenergetic. So uh, people are eating the same amount of calories. What is very here is the amount of carbohydrate or fat. So those that eat more monounsaturated fat, the kind you find in olive oil, uh, have a higher uh, reduction in their fatty livers that, than those that are eating a high carb diet. So same amount of calories, but if you eat more fat, you get less fat in your liver. So we need to avoid the temptation of using the simplistic uh, thinking that I eat fat, therefore I get fat, or I eat fat, therefore I will have uh, liver fat. It is not how the body works. Actually, uh, when you eat a lot of fructose, a lot of sugar, the liver is trying to detoxify it, and one of the ways it does it is by converting it into fat, and some of the fat gets accumulated in the liver. This is another paper, okay, another uh, randomized control study. <coughs> And it shows that intrahepatic liver fat accumulation decreases significantly in the low carb group compared to the low fat group. And total energy intake was also further decreased in the low carb group. We've seen that. It's a more satiating diet. So if you don't control the diets for calories, the low carb group will eat less, which is good. This is a paper by, by Dr. Ehrman. Uh, which is uh, from, from here, from, from, from the UK. So I know he's a good friend of Dr. Mahoti. Um, and it's a pilot study of what low carb can do for uh, people with fatty liver. GGT is one of the liver enzymes that you can use as a surrogate marker for fatty liver. 
Okay. Now, pre-intervention, post-intervention, and what you see is the GGT goes from 76, a medium value, to 41. So it cannot be bad for your liver if your liver is actually getting better with it. Okay. This is yet another paper. This is a small one, a pilot study, but I found it interesting because it's not using um, surrogate markers. They, they, these guys underwent liver biopsy to measure, in fact, measure the amount of fat. Okay. Now, uh, biopsy evidence of fatty liver were in people now with uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, were instructed to follow the diet, which is a very low carb ketogenic diet. Okay, and of the five patients they had, four uh, of the liver biopsies showed uh, improvements in steatosis, which is fatty liver, uh, inflammatory grade, and fibrosis. Um, and now it's in the news, okay? How a carb-restricted diet battles fatty liver disease? So it's probably becoming more mainstream, the idea that if you reduce carbs, it's good for the liver. So this news report is actually reflecting a very interesting paper. The paper is this one, and they gave an isocaloric low-carb diet with increased protein. So this was, by design, a high-protein diet, low-carb. Okay, and they looked at the effects of people with fatty liver and saw a dramatic reduction in liver fat. Now, it was an isocaloric because always uh, people th uh, say, okay, this low carb diet, it is good just because people eat less and uh, lose weight and then their liver gets better. If it was only that, it would already be good, okay? But now, they gave people more than 300,000 calories a day so to prevent them to lose weight, okay? So they should force themselves to eat a lot of low-carb food just to keep their, their weight stable. But see, the liver fat went dramatically down. And this is 14 days, if I remember, okay? This is two weeks. So hope I've convinced you that it's not bad for the liver. <laughs> but all low carb and bone health. This has been circulating around a lot. It's a, it is an urban legend, okay? Uh, because low carb would supposedly be a high protein diet. We saw it isn't. But let's go with it. Let's suppose it is a high protein diet, okay? And it would lead to osteoporosis. Why is that? Because all this protein, that's how it's, it goes, okay? All this protein will result in an acidic metabolism, an acidic environment that needs to be tamponated, controlled by the body. And this should require calcium and phosphorus from the bones. That is the myth and it is put. So I'll give you some trivia. What you eat does not change your body pH. Okay, body pH is kept at a very narrow range and it's controlled by your kidneys, not the bones. <laughs> the bones are for other purposes. Okay. So why is this circulating? Because patients with chronic metabolic acidosis do lose bone mass. Okay, so people with kidney disease, for example, they cannot excrete the excess acid that, they, that builds up in their body. And they end up with problems in their bones. Okay? But these patients, they have acidosis because they have kidney disease, not because they ate steak. Okay? <laughs> Again, if you have well-functioning kidneys, it will regulate the pH of the body by regulating the pH of the urine. Yep. That's how it happens. Okay? So what you eat won't make your blood acidic or alkaline. Thank God, okay? Because uh, it, uh, metabolic acidosis is not something good. Now, look at this paper. They actually put people on a low or a high protein diet. And what they see is, in fact, if you eat a high protein diet, you excrete more calcium in your urine. So this seems to vindicate the myth. Okay, you eat more protein, you start peeing more calcium. It should be coming from your bones. But these guys were very clever. They, they decided to measure how much calcium you are actually absorbing in your gut. And it goes up also. 
okay? So what happens is a high protein diet makes you absorb more calcium from your food. As you ingest more calcium, you eliminate more calcium, but it does not come from your bones. Um, this is the kind of paper that the title is so precise that you don't need to read anything <laughs> else, okay? A diet high in meat protein and potential renal acid load increases the fractional calcium absorption and urinary calcium excretion without affecting markers of bone resorption. That's all you need to know. Now, this must be the nail in the coffin of this story because it is uh, from the National Osteoporosis Foundation, okay? It is a meta-analysis and systematic review, and what they found is, although the scientific literature is somewhat limited with the regards of the beneficial effects of protein intake, beneficial, our analysis does not indicate the presence of any adverse relations. So, see, the the narrative is changing. Nobody is seriously thinking that protein may be bad for your bones. What is being discussed is how good it is for your bones. Because guys, bones are not only calcium and phosphorus. They are collagen also, they are protein also. You need protein to build strong bones. Overall, the evidence shows that the effect of dietary protein on this skeleton of being appears to be favorable <coughs> and not detrimental. So the conclusion is, current evidence shows no adverse effects of higher protein intakes. Although there were positive, positive trends on the bone mineral density at most bone sites, only the lumbar spine showed moderate evidence to support the benefits of higher protein diet. Okay? So it, it, it is beyond ridiculous to talk that a high protein diet should be bad for your bones. Nobody is talking it. Not even the National Osteoporosis Foundation. So let's put this myth to rest. What about gout? Gout, as you know, is an inflammation of, usually it happens uh, in the big toe, but it can affect any other uh, joint. Okay? It, is, it happens because of deposition of uric acid crystals. And it's said to be because of too much red meat and seafood. That's what, uh, and, and probably the dietitians that are here, they learn this at school, that people with gout should avoid seafood, should avoid red meat, should avoid protein, okay? Because this is what's being taught. Uh, they are told to avoid too much protein. And there is so this myth that low carb diet will worsen or cause gout because, you know, it's a high protein diet. So, first thing you need to know, a high serum uric acid is common in people with gout, but most people with elevated uric acid levels will never develop gout. So, having a high uric level, uh, uric acid level, is not a disease, it's just a blood marker. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be treated, okay? What is uric acid, after all? is an end product of the metabolism of purines, which doesn't help, because what are purines? <laughs> <laughs> there are class of organic molecules that are present in animals and plants, but particularly in DNA. So stuff that is alive usually have purines. Stuff that is not alive, like sugar or flour, are very low in purines. So purines, it's a big class of molecules. Uh, like caffeine is one of them, but uh, adenine and guanine that you remember uh, from the DNA base pairs are also purines. So it is almost unavoidable that we, you will eat those compounds. Okay? And the problem here is the same that plagues nutritional reasoning, <coughs> the simplistic view. Remember when I told you, you cannot think that if I eat fat, I will have fatty liver. You should not think that if you eat purines, you have gout. You need to prove it. You need to go beyond the mechanism. You need to see the randomized control trials. Well, let's see what the Gout Society of the UK has to say. Okay. 
which foods should be avoided? Uh, offal, viscera, game, oil, fish, seafood, meat, and yeast extracts. Really hard to do a low carb diet if you don't eat any of those. Mm -hmm. Now, low purine foods include bread, cereals, <coughs> except except for whole grain. So you should eat white bread, okay? Pasta and noodles. Now, to make it very clear, they tell you what you should be eating, which should be healthy for you if you have gout. Plenty of bread, other cereals and potatoes. Try to eat some whole grain, not a lot because it has purines, okay? Uh, moderate amounts of meat, fish, and alternative. alternatives, whatever. <laughs> but what about the science? If you, if you go and look at the PubMed, at the literature, the evidence that you should avoid meat is completely epidemiological. And as Dr. Mohotram showed you, this is a lower level of, of evidence. We should be basing decision in randomized control trials. The great majority of purines are endogenous, just like cholesterol. Dr. Mahotra told you, uh, eating cholesterol does not raise your cholesterol significantly. It is produced by your liver. And the same is true for purines. So why you should avoid it in the food? If you actually try to do this diet for gout, uh, it will usually reduce the uric acid levels by no more than 1.5 which is clinically irrelevant, when people can actually follow it, which is never. <laughs> Nobody can do that. Go online and see how the diet is built. But this is the most amazing slide of this gout stuff. There were only three randomized controlled trials tri testing the gout diet, and all three were negative. There simply is no published evidence that a low purine diet would be good for somebody with gout. Now, what happens if, if you give people sugar or high fructose corn syrup? So when you give them fructose, then the uric acid go up immediately. And now you should think, why is that? Since sugar has no purines, sugar is something so devoid of nutrients that it doesn't even have purines, okay? But their uric acid goes up. I don't have a slide for that, but just so you know, Eric, Eric said that. Uh, your liver uses a lot of ATP to metabolize the fructose, and the ATP degrades to ADP, AMP, and the A, adenine, is a purine. That's where the purine comes from, okay? Well, now let's see this. This is a trial, this is an experiment. Beneficial effects of weight loss associated with moderate calorie carbohydrate restriction and increased protein and increased unsaturated fat. Okay, this is a study that is giving basically the opposite diet that, that we've learned that we should give to patients with gout. Huh? So again, low carb, Increased protein, uric acid goes down. Not only this, the gout attacks go, go down also. Okay, these are people with severe disease. You see, you have people here with two attacks per month, three gout attacks per month. So they don't get completely rid of it, but it decreases significantly. And interestingly, it decreases much more than the, the, the uric acid levels. So it seems to be good because also they are uh, ingesting a diet that is less inflammatory. Because remember, gout is an inflammatory disease. Now, let's go further. Let's try an Atkins diet in people with gout and see what happens. Because the conventional wisdom is, if you have gout and you do an Atkins diet, it would kill you, basically. <laughs> okay. Despite consuming a diet rich in protein, red meat, seafood, and a very low carbohydrates, the serum uric acid levels decreased in this group after six months. Now, I must tell you, usually it goes up 
in the very f in the first few months, and then it goes down. Okay, it is not unusual for someone that is starting in a low carb diet to have a, a biphasic response. The, the the thing goes up and then goes up. And the results were more remarkable in patients that ha had higher uric acids and they uh, and patients that were more obese. The more obese and younger, the greater the benefit. Now, I'll tell you why. Because these people that were more obese, they had metabolic syndrome. And high uric acid is part of the metabolic syndrome. So it doesn't really matter that you are eating red meat or fish. What matters is you are getting your metabolic syndrome better. And that's why gout is becoming better. Because it's part of a syndrome. OK? And this is what happened with the levels of uric acid in the Atkins diet in this group. So yeah, there were only three randomized controlled trials testing the low purine diet, and they were all negative. But the few that tested a low carb diet were all positive. Go figure. And now the news is starting to show stuff like this. Could a ketogenic diet alleviate gout? Gout. So you see the narrative again is changing. Mm -hmm. People are not really thinking that this is bad. They are trying to gauge how good it is. So can we fix the nutritional guidelines? Because we saw that uh, the single focus on LDL is misguided. We saw that uh, low carb seems to be very good for obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. And we saw that the myths that are preventing uh, health practitioners to adopt the strategy are this, they are myths. So Brazil has, since to, in 2014, what is considered widely the most revolutionary food guidelines in the world. Okay, should be proud of that. Instead of focusing on macronutrients, particular nutrients, focusing on fat, for example, it deals with the real problem, which is processed and ultra-processed foods and the food industry. Right? So these are the 10 steps to a healthy diet according to the guidelines from 2014. And if you look at it, they are completely compatible with a low-carb approach. Make natural or minimally processed foods the basis of your diet. Limit consumption of processed foods. Avoid consumption of ultra-processed shopping places that offer a variety of natural or minimally processed foods, develop exercise and share cooking skills, out of home prefer places that serve freshly made meals, and be wary of food advertising and marketing. And I should add, be wary of the food guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> so why do we care about the US or the UK guidelines? Okay, for us here that are Brazilians, we're fine. <laughs> because the US guidelines still have a huge influence in the way nutrition is taught around the world. That, 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 that's what happens. I mean, I talk to a lot of uh, registered dietitians, and they say that nowadays, 2018, they are still teaching the food pyramid in nutrition school. And the dietitians are still being taught that saturated fat clogs your arteries, that starchy food is okay, it has a, has a free pass. And for everybody, including the obese and the diabetics, that starchy food should be okay, and that processed low-fat good is good for you. That was being taught. So we need to fight to break the evidence-free spell of modern nutrition. Low carb is not a high protein diet, but even if it were, it would not harm the kidneys, okay? It is not a high protein diet, but even if it were, it would still be good for the liver. It is not a high protein <coughs> diet, but even if it were, it would be good for bone health. Low carb improves overall lipid profile in most people. As Dr. Malhotra showed you, the lipid profile is more than LDL. Okay, if it improves your total cholesterol to HDL ratio, you can tell it improves your overall lipid profile. In most randomized controlled trials, low carb is better for weight loss without the need for calorie restriction. Because let me tell you, you some papers show that it's the same. 
but most of those papers have calorie restriction. So it is, in my view, more or less the same situation as having a race between a regular car and a sports car, but you set a speed limit, okay? Nobody can go beyond 30 kilometers per hour, and then the regular car and the sports car reach the finish line at the same time. And then you tell the cars are exactly the same. It's not true. One car is much better than the other, but the way you set up the race may, may you reach uh, an artificial conclusion. So again, if you have two diets being compared, one of them makes you less hungry than the other, but you make the calories artificially equal, then you can reach those false conclusions. Low carb is superior for diabetes management. There is no doubt about it. Is the best dietary intervention for metabolic syndrome by far. And guys, it's not the only health approach for nutrition, okay? But it should be included in the guidelines as a tool to be offered by healthcare providers. I think this is the message we need to carry on. Thank you.